Like so much during the pandemic COVID-19 since March 2020, we have adapted, we are flexible, we are excited, and yes, we are simultaneously a bit anxious. You see, this will be a landmark, a turning point, an experiment that challenges us, an outstanding event in our history, not only of the past, but for the future as well. Why? We are manifesting this convocation online through a webinar via Zoom with a live segment at the TMI North Room. We recently purchased a new machine to allow us to enter the hybrid environment, not only for this convocation, but courses in the future. We have rehearsed, really we did, but technology is not always forbearing, not even mildly at times tolerant, and we humans sometimes feel controlled by forces beyond us. So if external bitches occur tonight, let us internally at least be patient with this endeavor. On with the program. Here in the North Room, of our TMI downtown offices, we have seated the star of tonight's happening, Alexi Iverson, who will receive his Thomas More Institute graduation certificate. His Bishop's University diploma will be available in August. His parents, who like me, I'm sure are relieved that this part of his journey is over. And seated too is the executive director of TMI, Dina Suleiman. Later, I will introduce TMI's new manager of academic affairs. Every ship needs a captain, and today our executive director is not at the helm, but she continues to guide us through calm weather and rough waters. A word of greeting from Dina Suleiman. Dina, please. Thank you, Len, for the introduction. Thank you all for being here tonight at our 2021 Convocation Ceremony. I would like to get to congratulate Alexi and his family for being with us here tonight for this special evening. This year has been like no year that most of us have encountered. We have been tested beyond our normal limits, but at the same time, the irony of adversity has revealed the strength of our community and the importance that each one of us has to each other. A life without direct human contact, the absence of our gatherings, has given us a special appreciation for our previous day-to-day -day lives that perhaps we had taken for granted. I have been executive director at TMI, TMI now for three years. And what I can clearly say is that TMI is a special and unique place. A place for lifelong learners, a place where curiosity is encouraged, dialogue is respected, and all opinions are heard. These elements create a culture where the intellect can blossom and every individual can enter a lifelong love affair with learning. Though this past year we struggled, as many organizations did, and we wondered how we would still learn together when we could not be together. However, through the might of our determination, our volunteers, staff, and community, we found the tools and the resources that we needed to succeed in this new online reality. As we stand here tonight in this hybrid Zoom world, and celebrate our graduate. This is a testament to the strength of everyone involved on this journey tonight. Thank you all. A TMI graduate is an individual who's engaged in lifelong, lifelong journey of discovery and self-discovery, who understands the power of the question and who understands that we do not have all the answers. With this understanding, our graduates leave our institute aware that the journey in life is all about exploring and sharing your curiosity. At TMI, 
We help you embark on that journey, but you steer the ship. A quote from Bernard Lonergan, one of the great philosophers of the 20th century and an influential figure at TMI, captures our learning spirit here at TMI. His quote, total surrender to the demands of the human spirit. Be attentive, be intelligent, be reasonable, be responsible, be in love. Thank you for being with us here tonight. Thank you. And thank you, Dina. That was a wonderful summary of what we are all about as we enter our 76th year. I have another interesting introduction to make at this point in our evening. This lady is a distinguished longtime member of our community. As a matter of fact, she is a necessary pillar of our organization. From key positions in her academic career with Marianopolis College, she brought rich knowledge to TMI. I first met her when she led a fascinating course called The Ballad way back when I was a student, and that's a way back. Since then, she became a colleague and edited two of my books. She has designed and led innumerable courses, was chair of our board of directors for years, and has imparted her wisdom and skills in just about every area of TMI's operation. This lady wonderfully bridges the gap between generations by her curiosity, vigor, and open-mindedness. She is about to briefly contribute aspects of the Thomas More history with us, factual and from her perspective. I'm delighted to present Anne Fitzpatrick. Anne, you're on. Len, you didn't call me venerable. I'm very grateful that you didn't <laughs> because the only thing that I feel venerable about is that I am of an age with Thomas More Institute. 2021 and 1945 have much in common for TMI. Here we are, hybrid Zoom for the first time, and there they were, the young founders of the Institute, convinced that adult learning in post-war Canada had, quote, to be at the level of our time close quotes, big dreams. But that conviction and foresight that need to innovate and imagineer has not changed. To highlight aspects of TMI history, I'm referring to a little text. We do that a lot at TMI. This one is called Informed Dialogue. It was produced in 2004, edited by Patrick Dias and Charlotte Tansy. It's dog-eared because I use it a lot. In the introduction, Charlotte sets out distinct periods. The first, post-1945, university lectures by scholars, among them notably Bernard Lonergan, affiliation with Université de Montréal, bold outreach and seven years of warm apprenticeship with the Great Books Foundation in Chicago, which used reading and discussion, steps taken in-house to design courses in the disciplines. This, by the way, was the period when Len and I showed up at the Institute and, and Irene Meneer and Heather Stevens as well. The Research Institute, now the Research Center, was inaug inaugurated at this time, annually hosting scholars and providing a venue for publications by independent researchers. Then in what we can call the middle period from about the 1970s, a new affiliation with Bishop's University. 18 years of midday interviews with well-known thinkers held at the Royal Bank Auditorium in Place Ville Marie with TMI staff, including Roberta Macknick, descending with readings from the Drummond Street office. 
Leaders Training Weekend offered every fall. Are your eyes glazing over? Informed dialogue does not mention the course prospect eye that rolled out every year involving, you know, hours of demanding academic research, planning, a phone call to all leaders in August, etc. Who can overlook the seniors outreach program, specially designed for residences and cultural centers over the city? Less well known were offerings in prisons for which Martin O'Hara always chose his most colorful times. An afternoon television class, sessions on the West Island for the visually impaired, etc. Particular favorites though, were the annual exhibitions of contemporary Quebec artists, symposia and anniversary celebrations. This last year, 2021, a whole curriculum online, even prompting webinar interviews, series of conversations, all at the level of our time. I cherish one special memory and gift. It's this little pin presented in a ceremony called the Order of the Golden Table. It's a little round pin. And it, it was to recognize 10 years of leading discussions. For me, it symbolizes the shared inquiry that is our mantra and reminds us of the generous nudge that such inquiry can offer. Charlotte again, quote, to escape the prison of one's own too often repeated viewpoint. Only when expressed in an attentive group does one realize how stale it is, close quotes. Here is a legacy and an opportunity even more valuable, it seems to me, than right now. Thank you. Thank you, Anne, for providing us with an illuminating TMI historical perspective as we enter our 76th year. And I just had a note in my thinking, we have an archival team that's working together to archeologically dig out a lot of records and documents of our 76th year history. This will be provided to students who we have hired for the summer to work on our archives. So Anne, just as I requested from Dina, please hold on to what you gave us today because we can use this for our archives later. Everybody, the next portion of our menu will be equally informative while we celebrate today's graduate. I'm happy to present David Dusso with distinct business acumen and exceptional skill articulating. He also has an interesting background with TMI. I met David as a fellow student over 20 years ago in a writing course. He's our current TMI treasurer, a course animator, and has a great collection of maxims, axioms, or aphorisms, offering them at just the right timing with us. He's about to conduct the roundtable treat with TMI graduates from former years, 1975, 1989, 1996, 2004, and 2012. David, that's your cue. Wow. Well, thank you very much, Len. Um, uh, and uh, I'd like to say good evening to, um, to all, everyone who has joined us here for this, uh, this uh, terrific event, a convocation, uh, the convocation of a terrific young man, by the way. Um, Alexei is... Uh, is a, has been a, a wonderful, uh, a wonderful student at uh, TMI, and and uh, everybody has been so keen and and so uh, excited about his success, and of course about his convocation. Tonight we're going to have a, a very brief uh, and very informal roundtable uh, discussion, 
Um, and I'm going to start very quickly by introducing myself and then asking everybody to, to uh, on the table to do the same. Um, as you know, I'm David uh, Dussault, as, as Len has told you, and I am a graduate here of uh, 2004. Uh, and my 2004 graduation is interesting only in as far as I graduated um, exactly four days after my uh, my daughter at uh, Queen's uh, University, but in the same year, so so that was good. And and Thomas More has been a uh, the one of the best little discoveries of my life, and uh, a place that I am uh, increasingly happy to call home because I I spend as much time uh, at the institute as I do pretty well anywhere else. So I've talked enough and I'd like to uh, perhaps go, well, I'd go from left to right, but it doesn't really matter. Um, Pat, why don't you start? And then we'll go to Claire and then Stuart and then Kay. So Pat. Oh, good evening, everyone. I graduated with my BA from Thomas More in 2004. So I was a co-classmate of David's. Mm -hmm. And um, there were also two other students. So we were four who graduated that year. And um, I would you like to know a little bit about what brought me into Thomas More? Please, please. Oh, my friend, uh, the late Catherine Gleason is the reason I came to the Thomas More Institute. She was my neighbor. We commuted to work together. And um, the Institute struck a Catherine Gleason lifelong learning award in her memory because uh, she was a student and participant at Thomas More for over 50 years. So I was a little older and my family had, had grown up, you might say, and it was because of Catherine's influence I came here. And uh, I was a tentative student at first, but I remember very well my first impression. And my first impression was they wanted to know what I thought. And my second impression was it was the most respectful environment that I was sitting in. So this kept me coming back. It encouraged me. And Martin O'Hara invited me for an interview and asked me if I would like to become um, a, a student, uh, you know, credit student, because I was doing all the work anyway. So I kind of said, no, I don't think so, because uh, I'll probably be 65 before I graduate. He kind of smiled at me and he said, Patricia, the day is going to come when you're 65 anyway. <laughs> With that kind of logic, I, I couldn't argue. And I, I became a credit student. I enjoyed it. I, I, I learned how to discuss. I experienced learning through discussion. I also learned that um, it was important to listen. And that prompted the respectful atmosphere that worked so well for me. So I have enjoyed my, my experience with Thomas More. I'm still part of the, the group. Um, I was very happy to reach my goal. And when I reached my goal, I was 64. <laughs> <laughs> Just under Thank the <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Very Thank you. Thank you. Claire. Yes. Well, I graduated in 1996 and I was 64. <laughs> <laughs> so that's an interesting coincidence. Anyway, I got my BA from Bishop's University in Lennoxville, Quebec, and I went there to receive my diploma, accompanied by Heather. Stephen, who had um, really guided me through my five years of um, taking courses and occasionally having to bully me a little bit and was a wonderful power to me. And I'm sorry she couldn't be here tonight, not well. But I graduated the same year as my youngest son graduated from his college and we have six children <laughs> and he was 23 and I was 64. And he'd gone to boarding school at that moment 
when I had no children at home anymore, I wanted to, stu to study. So I called Archie Malik, and who was a professor at McGill, and told him I wanted to study and said, should I go to McGill? And he said, you could. And I said, that doesn't sound very enthusiastic. <laughs> and he said, they're a wonderful university and they'll give you a diploma. That is what they exist to do. But if you want to ask questions about the issues of our times, find out about countries and the policies they've followed and are following, um, go to Thomas More. Well, I had never heard of Thomas More. I had only fairly recently come to Canada. I married a Canadian having been born in England. Anyway, I had great respect for Archie Malik, so I went to check it out and signed up for a course and which the only one that was available was on ge geology, which I thought I'm not really interested in that. But I loved the whole process. I just based on asking questions and being sent to investigate the answers. And when I decided that I was going to study at Thomas More and why not go for a degree, which I had not got, I had to write a lot of essays. It took me five years to complete all the requirements to be given the BA by Bishop's University. I have stayed on, I have learned how to become a leader and have been a designer. I've now been on the board for several years and I'm an enthusiastic supporter of Thomas More and will always be so. Thank you, Claire. Thank you very, very much. Stuart. Hi, uh, I graduated in 2012. And I think my journey getting to TMI is a little bit uh, interesting because uh, I had been, I was about halfway through my working career. I worked most of my career at St. Mary's Hospital in the labs, but I had taken a, a year's leave of absence. I was working at the, in the tiny lab at the Catherine Booth Hospital, which if any of you know is right near Loyola campus and um, I thought maybe I could take some courses at Loyola right next door because my workload at the Catherine Booth was wasn't great so I had time in the afternoon but uh, as it happens I, I, I started surfing and I found the liberal arts program at uh, Concordia and I thought this is exactly what I want to do and it so happens that I, a nurse that was working right next to me, she was running a cardiac program. I, I was all excited. I, I, I was speaking to her about this and she said, oh, the dean of the liberal arts program at Concordia is in my cardiac program. <laughs> Why don't you go speak to him? So I went to see him. He was on the treadmill and he said, uh, come and see me in my office. Uh, everything starts with the Bible. Uh, you know, We'll have a chat. And, and I ended up taking a a course at Concordia in their liberal arts program, a great books course. Uh, but to my dismay, I found out that most of the, the courses were during the day, the ones that I really wanted to take. So once again, I was back at the Catherine Booth and, and it so happened again that th there was a patient uh, who I started, I, I, I was recounting this story to and he said, well, have you thought of the Thomas More Institute? So, well, I've never heard of the Thomas More Institute. Actually, I probably had because they used to advertise in the Gazette and I would see it and I had the crest and I would always wonder, well, what's that about? But anyway, uh, so it began, the wheels began turning and lo and behold, I was walking my dog one day in Point Claire and I ran into a man uh, who started telling me about his, his history and education. He, was, he had finished a master's in history at Concordia, and then he said, but I go to the Thomas More Institute also, you should go talk to Heather Stevens. And uh, so that's what I did. I, uh, I walked in uh, to the Thomas More Institute and I saw those shelves of books and uh, went into Heather's office. And of course there were more books and some of them dangerously, you know, about to fall off the shelf. And there were so many. <laughs> and uh, that's where it began. And uh, just to, to 
to to recount a uh, you know a couple of things about my experience. Uh, you know, I'm not a very talkative person. I'm usually very shy, but to my surprise, uh, when I enrolled in the writing course, uh, I found out we had to read our our work, and I was a little bit worried about that, but. Uh, it was such a friendly atmosphere that uh, magically uh, it was easy and I, I enjoyed it. And, uh, uh, you know, there were so many, there were so many great courses, you know, uh, the math course, with, math course with Ken McKenzie, the bagpipe, her, uh, was another great one. And I don't know, Claire, if you remember, I was in your geology course. And, uh, yes, and when just four of us, I think. Oh, yeah. And one of my fond memories is we did the fossil walk. Yes. And we walked down Sherbrooke and um, I took my daughter on that walk uh, once beautiful spring day about two years later. And it was just fantastic. And so, so um, those are, you know, very happy memories. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you very much. Kay, last but certainly not least. Hey. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for having me. I'm a, it's a, an honor to be included here. Uh, I first heard of TMI in my early 20s when I was taking a translation course in an adjacent classroom at Darcy McGee. And I was intrigued by these people, but also intimidated by the course outlines. So I never went near the place. But as I worked my way out of secretarial jobs into public relations, writing and editing, I began to feel very uneducated. So by 1976, and now well into my 30s, I was ready to take the plunge. My first course was the dialectic of intimacy. The first question I got in the that first class was, how do you know what you're doing when you're knowing? I had no idea how to answer that question, but I was hooked. It took me 13 years, taking one course a year or sometimes two. Actually, I wasn't in a hurry because I wanted to savor each new topic. Along the way to graduating, I gave up my day job to become a mother and decided to take the leader training course. So just in case it'd be an asset if I decided to go back to work. Instead, Charlotte Tanzi thought I should put it to use immediately. So I can't recall what year that was, but I saw it as a good fit being both a student and a leader. So by 1989, I was well into my 40s, having finally learned to think for myself and to use my voice. Thank you, Kay. That's wonderful. I, you know, it's, it's funny how all of the stories are, are, um, are, are there's a certain similarity in that um, Thomas More just happened to be discovered uh, by, by, by all of us, which I, I think is, is, is rather unique. And, and, and I think in, in speaking with Claire earlier in the day, um, I had mentioned that uh, Thomas More is, is uh, um, one of the best kept secrets um, in, in Montreal. And, and, and of course, Claire rightfully said, and yes, and that's a shame because if more people knew about us, um, um, you know, that probably our, our, our uh, student enrollment picture would look quite a bit different. But I would like to just take this opportunity just to go back to when, when uh, we were all first students and, and coming back to school at a later point in life. Was there any sense of intimidation? Um, Pat, did you have any sense of intimidation when you came back in? When I first began, I yeah. did. I was very quiet and, and like Stuart, I was shy. I wasn't used to, I had a lot of opinions, but I guess I kept it to myself. <laughs> so when I ha had to answer questions and give me uh, my opinions, I, I felt it a very strange experience, but, but you quickly learn the respect. It was respectful listening that really overwhelmed me. You quickly learn that what everybody says is of interest and you're learning at the stage in life at which you're ready to learn. That was fascinating. And so it, it's encouraging too, because you can believe, well, I, can, I don't have to speed things up. I can take my time within the time frame allotted, but you, you can adapt to where you are in your life at that time, which I, I just found wonderful. 
-hmm. it suited me like a hand in glove. Okay. Good, good. Kay, how about you? Was, was there any any intimidation factor? Did you feel a um, oh my goodness, I'm uh, the, this school business. It's um, you know I, I'm going to be after so many years. I'm I'm going to um, I'm going to be spinning my wheels. Um. Well, you know, I was I was very nervous, <clears throat> and you know I mean I came from you know graduated from high school in 1960. Uh, I had a very um, <sighs> very rigid schooling. And I really didn't learn to think for myself. So coming into, into a classroom here, which you were expected to think, uh, kind of threw me. Um, I remember <clears throat> the, the, sec the first course didn't scare me too much. The second one though was the uh, self-transcendence and it was primarily Lonergan. <laughs> and I was in over my head. Honestly, I thought, well, what is this? I don't understand a word he's saying. But I had to write the essays. And I discovered in writing the essays that you are not expected to know everything he's saying. Obviously, it took him a lifetime to get there. Um, but what I needed to do was just relate in whichever way my limited experience allowed me to. Mm. And I got a tremendous amount of encouragement um both from the leaders and from the experience of writing those essays it, it was writing the essays was the uh, mm -hmm. all through all through was the, the the magic i guess right right yeah you're right about that um it, it, you know but Stuart, i'm wondering you know uh, um uh, kay just mentioned um uh, uh, lonergan's uh, course called transcendence were there any was there any specific uh, uh, course that that um that uh, when you found yourself in it, you said to yourself, oh my God, am I ever overmatched or what the hell am I doing here? Was there anything like that that happened? Um... Well, I think perhaps my first course, it was uh, Dante's Inferno and there were so many uh, well-spoken people uh, there. Uh, I was a little intimidated. Uh, however, I had just jumped from Concordia and it was really at Concordia where I was, you know, I had come from a, a science background I, I hadn't written an essay so I, I still remember not knowing where to start uh, but I did learn a bit there and so I, I, I was able to use that knowledge when I arrived at TMI but of course the teaching method is different so you're sitting around the table and you're expected to uh, to participate at Concordia I was in a huge class with a bunch of uh, you know teens and early 20s uh, People in their early 20s so that in itself was a bit intimidating but uh, I wasn't speaking very much at Concordia but I arrived at TMI and boom you know you were you had to to get in there and so that was a bit challenging. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah yeah um, um, Claire I was curious did, did had you had any mathematics uh, uh, at, at any point prior to your 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 uh, going for your uh, your bachelor's degree, because I know mathematics was a, a required course uh, for for a TMI uh, uh, to get a BA here. Um, yes, and and no, how did, really, how did that had, sit with you? Well, I'd had my early education in Argentina in Spanish, hmm. and where their whole philosophy was learn it by heart. And I had a very good sort of photographic memory and I could learn a page off by heart and get very high marks. Then when I went back to England and went to an English boarding school, they asked me things like, what would you have done if you were Napoleon before Waterloo? Mm -hmm. And I panicked and said, where's that written down? Right. <laughs> <laughs> So I had to learn to think, as uh, Patricia was saying, okay, I forget which. Um, but math, I thought I could not do. And I learned that, yes, I could. Um, I can't say I'm a, a mathematician in any way. I'm not. But Thomas More was just a wonderful experience altogether. I loved it. Good, thank you. Now, you know the thing about Thomas More is that is that, and I, I mean, I, I look around and 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 you're all present. Uh, um, uh, it it kind of gets into your into your blood. I I don't know how to explain it other than that. <laughs> and it's this 
um, I think it's the, the, I think Pat, you hit the nail on the head before when you said um, it was such a, a wonderful, respectful place. And, and, you know, you go originally to become, to, 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 to get your degree or to become a student or to, you know, to, to itch your curiosity. But a funny thing happens to you. The next thing you know, you're, you're making friends and you find yourself a part of, of the community. Um, at K, you know, you said that you took a long time to do your degree, but I, I know I had the, the honor and the pleasure of having you as a course leader when I was doing my degree. So you're a, a classic case of someone who, and everybody here really, got in, got into the blood and, and somehow you're still, um, we still have you under contract. Right. How do you explain that? <laughs> I don't know. I, I was just always very comfortable. And, and uh, there was always a, a challenge. I mean, sh sh in the days when Charlotte was, was recruiting the, um, the, the leaders for each course, I mean, she would always come up with three suggestions that she'd think I would be interested in. And I mean, I, I, it was very hard to choose. They were, they were all good. Mm. Uh, and no, I, I was hooked. I couldn't have lived without, <laughs> without Thomas More, really. It was... And I remember when I was first sort of coming, Charlotte one day said, Claire, I want you to lead a course about the relationship between Greece and Turkey and that whole area. And I said, but Charlotte, I don't know anything about that. And she said, well, I want you to co-lead with, uh, I've forgotten his name, but she said he has 400 books on the subject. He knows everything there is to know, and you can supply the wide-eyed wonder. <laughs> <laughs> Never forgotten that. <laughs> but I agree with getting under your, uh, you know, the Thomas More gets in, into your blood, because during my course of studies, we moved from the city to the Laurentians. Mm -hmm. So it was a good hour and 50-minute drive. And I thought when we moved there, I thought I'm too far away. I, I just can't. So I stopped going to the Institute for two years. And then I just, uh, I missed it so much. I thought, I don't care. I'll be able to do that hour and 15 minute drive, you know? And I rearranged things differently just to keep going because I missed, I missed being there. And, yeah. you know, walked in the door and there was Heather. Hi, how are you? Yes. It's yes. lovely. <laughs> That that you know, I mean, I think that's one of the nice things about uh, uh, about Thomas More is that there's there's always you know when you walk in those those doors, uh, and for me it's Atwater Street. It could have been any one of a number of different streets over the years, but for me it's Atwater Street. And you walk in the door, and and it doesn't matter who happens to be on duty that day. It's it, you kind of walk in the door and you want to say, "Hi, mom, I'm home. What's the eat?" You know, it's it's, <laughs> it's that good. But the the other thing that I that 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 I've noticed about Thomas More um, is that um, how shall I put it? Um, while we're all very very um, um, happy to be Thomas More um, uh, graduates and Thomas. I'm wondering, uh, I know, and I'm speaking, thinking mostly of myself, um, I don't do the best job of recruitment. And, and I'm wondering, uh, I'm just throwing this out at you. I, I don't go out, to, you know, when in, it's not commonplace for me to say, oh, you're looking to do this? Why don't you go to Thomas More? Um, I, I, I don't know why I'm not that way. Um, does that ever happen to to any of you, or or are you bigger boosters than than this um, this this individual here that's that doesn't seem to want to uh, push a good thing forward? Well, I my one of my daughters comes to Thomas and takes courses, and she's she's younger, you know, and she just loves it too. She just finds it very very interesting. Yeah. But I know what you're saying. There's a certain age group we have to try and reach as well, and. Um, I guess the more you talk about it, the better, the easier it might be. We don't, maybe we don't move in those circles enough. I'm not sure. Well, it, that's interesting, Pat, because you know we're, 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 all the all the boomers, uh, if you will, uh, you know, we're we're uh, we're all together, and and uh, there's a big cohort of us. Um, but but yes, specifically, I'm wondering, um, Stuart, if if you see a, a, a 
some opportunity for that magic, um, you know, because you, you were looking to complete a degree. Um, there's there's some some magic that we may yet have for for that uh, shall we say thirty to forty five year old group that that seems to be underrepresented in our uh, in our our uh, our classrooms. Well, I've always hoped for that. I've, I've hoped that we. I'm not a way boomer. To to uh, to uh, you know appeal to that that age group. Uh, it's it's tricky, uh, but. Uh, you know, you really, you know, there's so many choices of things for people to do. And uh, when you're this, when you're as small as uh, Thomas More, it's, it's, uh, it's hard to compete, but I, I do have hope. Uh, I know we, we used to have the open houses and sometimes they were packed. Um, and there's, you know, perhaps that's another, another thing we can try again. Um, so we'll see. Uh, maybe more of events. Uh, these webinars they've been having have been fantastic. Uh, I hope that continues. Yeah. And, uh, you know, if people knew what it was like there, they would come. So it's just getting them there. <laughs> yeah, we just got to get them in the door. You're right. You're right. Yeah. Last question, because we have to wrap this thing up at some point in time. <laughs> if you were doing it again, okay. Someone comes up to you, and I, I don't believe in the Frank Sinatra business. Uh, you know, I've, I've got a regret, but only a few. I did it my way. I, I, because if, if, if you haven't examined your life and figured out that there'd be a number of things you'd want to want another go at, uh, I think maybe we're in the wrong institute here. Where it's, but, but my question is, if you were doing it all over again, would you do your degree earlier in life? Or was this a really good fit for you really good fit for me i couldn't have when i look back there i couldn't have gone from high school to university okay. uh because i had learned by rope somebody else said that too mm -hmm. you know didn't learn to think i could not have gone on to a regular regular program okay and i i needed the years in between i needed to uh uh to be a little more independent and whatnot mm -hmm. to be to be ready and it came at it came at the right time. It was yes, yeah, so like like Kay. I it came when I was ready for it to come. When I finished school, when I was matriculated at the school, I wasn't interested in carrying on. I wanted to uh, go to work, and travel, see the world. That was my focus at the time. And so I went to Thomas More. I think when the time was right for me to go to, I wouldn't do it over differently. Mm -hmm. No, and it came at the right time for me. I mean, having six children kept me pretty busy. <laughs> <laughs> I see. But when they, the last one left, then I wanted to study. Mm. And I hadn't studied before. We'd traveled when we first got married. We went out to the Philippines, invited by one man who was quite well known there who happened to have been in Canada and who we'd met. Um, and, um, you know, that led to Japan it, and then China and Taiwan and Vietnam and Myanmar and all those other places. I traveled a great deal. I, it came when the la, my last child left for college, for boarding school, I mean. Um, he went to Bishop's College School, um, and then he went to another school in the States, which he loved, and that is where he became a Quaker. It's all an interesting story, uh, <laughs> all of them. I know a Quaker family in Nova Scotia. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> Stuart, how about yourself? I couldn't, have, I couldn't have done it another way. Uh, I spent years thinking I was going to go back, um, but I assumed I was going to take science classes, continue on in science. And uh, I realized at one point, I really didn't like science as much as I thought I did. And when I started at TMI, I, I realized that's what I like to do. I like I like the liberal arts. That's And I still, to this day, it's, it's you know, the liberal arts, music, things like that. 
So I retired from science and I'm happy that I'm retired. So. Well, and I, I guess the Buddha was right when the students are ready, the teacher will appear. And mm -hmm. that seems to have what, uh, what, what seems yeah. to have happened to all of us. Well, I, I wanna just take a quick second to thank you all uh, uh, for, for, uh, for joining uh, this, this round table this evening. It, it's, really, uh, it's really kind of you to give the time and uh, wonderful to see your faces again. Um, that, that's uh, uh, really a, a bonus. And, and uh, I hope you stay well and, and hopefully, who knows, maybe this fall um, we'll be back to some semblance of normal and we'll be back in the classroom. But uh, until then, um, have a wonderful that's summer. Nice. Thank you very much. Thank Len, you. I believe it's over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, David, and our former graduates. Um, we haven't always been on Atwater. We used to rent facilities on Drummond Street. And um, seeing you're recalling your graduations, um, we graduated in a ceremony at the Ritz-Carlton Hotel, came back to our rented offices on Drummond Street, and I had been with TMI for a number of years, and my wife, who had attended that night, said to me, after meeting the staff then, I can see why you fell in love with this place. Uh, there are people tonight on the webinar who are not part of the community, and it sounds like we're a closed club, and we're, we're, we're not. Um, we're open, and yes, the under 35s is what we've been looking for for a number of years. But I just want to add, there's a lot of gray hair here tonight, except for Dina and except for Alexi. <laughs> but we're not all gray haired. We've been hiring, thanks mainly to our captain, to, to Dina, a lot of young people who have been working with us for over a year now. Students in the summer, a winter team, a spring team. So we are injecting more youth and energy from that source into our TMI. I just wanted to clarify that for some of you who are listening to these names we are dropping and these histories that we are recounting for you. The next portion of our menu will be equally informative. Um, and I have already said that regarding David and these people who have recalled for us. Now, Previous to the COVID-19, our convocation ceremonies featured processional and recessional musical fanfares. We welcome back tonight a former mathematics teacher of TMI who formulated appreciated take-home examinations and his music. Let me tell you something about him. We've heard him a couple of times tonight. Kenneth McKenzie comes from the Maritimes as a child, he reluctantly participated in Highland dancing. His mother told him he could not give it up until he would won a medal. Finally, at age 11, he won bronze due to lack of competition at that particular event. <laughs> and when he came home exultant in his triumph and new freedom, his mother announced that she had signed him up for bagpipe, bagpipe lessons starting the next week. That was one example of maternal meddling from which there were no regrets for either party. I was meddling. <laughs> I won the Ken learned the Highland bagpipes in Halifax from pipe major George Day, born 1879, where he played in local pipe bands. And in 1962, he represented the province of Nova Scotia in the opening of the Trans-Canada Highway and piped his way from Newfoundland to British Columbia. At our rehearsal for this convocation last week, Ken informed us that in 1968, he was on tour in Europe with Les Feux Follets. He now lives in Montreal, where he recently retired from teaching mathematics and statistics at McGill University. And when his children were young, he played a bagpiping Santa Claus at holiday parties for McGill <laughs> Mathematics Department and for Face School. Some of the older children at Face were skeptical that he was really Santa. Once kid came up to him and said accusingly, you're not Santa, you're just a man dressed in a red suit with a pillow under his shirt. Upon being dared to poke him in the stomach, the boy did so and then looked at his teacher with great surprise on his face 
Teacher, he said, that's real fat. <laughs> Ken has been pipe major in two Montreal area bands, the Pierrefonds Pipes and Drums and the Rodden Pipes and Drums. From 1981 to 1986, he was a member of the folk group Brom Seer, also known as Men Without Pants, and he can be heard on recordings by Kate and Anna McGarrigo. Ladies and gentlemen, yeah. this is Ken McKenzie. Thank you. Yeah, by the way, we only played as Men Without Pants One, and it's when there was a popular group called Men Without Hats, and that's what gave me the idea, because we were going to put on a show wearing kilts, you see. So of course it occurred to me that we could go as Men Without Pants. It was worked pretty well that way. A couple of things I heard interesting, I hadn't heard Archie Malik's name for quite a long time, but I was when I first started at McGill, he was around, and uh, we got along well. That was nice. Yes, you mentioned I did retire after 51 years of teaching mathematics at uh, McGill in last September, but uh, I haven't decided to stop teaching at all. There'll be some kind of teaching in my life. In my family, my mother and father were both teachers. My sister was a school principal in Winnipeg. I had a grandmother who was a teacher. And anyway, you get the idea. It's there. Yeah. <clears throat> anyway. I wasn't, uh, I actually can talk for hours at a time, but I told myself before I came on here at the end that I wouldn't talk for hours. So relax, rest easily, it'll be all right. The Buffalo hired me when they were dancing at Expo Sunset. And that's where it got started. And then I did a good job for them. So we had that terrific, starting out in Switzerland, we went to around France, we did Luxembourg, we did Belgium. Oh, we didn't have to pay a penny. And it was fun going right across Canada for the opening of the Trans-Canada Highway. Terrific. I said you could call it road to the A-I-S-L-E-S. -E but the bagpipe tune and the song, it's I-S-L-E-S, -E the Isles in Scotland. There you go. I better stop you if I do talk for hours. I'll play the tune for you. By the way, I should mention, I'm, I'm not a post-war baby, whatever we're called, those people are called. I'm too, uh, too old to be post-war. Thank you, Ken, for amplifying the pleasure of tonight's event. We'll be calling on you towards the end. Uh, everybody, the Thomas More Institute recently added to our staff a young man who is now our manager of academic affairs volunteering for the last five years as a member of and recently co-chair of the curriculum committee, designing and leading various courses. He has impressive academic leadership, teaching, collaborative research, 
and publishing credentials. A remarkable profile for one so young. I'm particularly interested in his current pursuit of the PhD individualized program at Concordia University. His working title of his thesis is Mere Love, Eros, Beauty and Fetish in the Works of C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien. It is my pleasure to direct our attention to our new manager of academic affairs, Joseph Bietri. Joseph, that's your cue. Thank you, Len. Hello, everybody. As Len mentioned, I'm the new manager of academic affairs. Though well, some of you may know me from the courses I have designed and led, I hope to speak with and meet with everyone in the coming weeks and months. While you will all get to know me today, our focus is on our graduates. So, Alexi, on behalf of the Thomas More Institute, we acknowledge you're having fulfilled all our requirements. The records of your performance has been submitted to for ratification by Bishop's University. You can look forward to being awarded the Bachelor of Art degree at their convocation, which has regrettably been delayed this year until August. It is my great pleasure to present you with our Thomas More Institute certificate and to offer congratulations on completing this undertaking. Congratulations. If we were live or if Joseph was here, he would be presenting this to Alexi with great relief oh on the God, part of his parents and his mentor. Dad wants a picture. Okay. Uh, just a reminder, uh, echoing yeah. Joseph, uh, that the Thomas More Institute certificate is today and the University of Arts Diploma will be available in August. Now is the time for the dessert of our carte du jour or bill of fare. Get ready for a lot of calories as I focus on our graduate, Alexi Iverson. <laughs> of the many members of the younger generations that I have mentored before and during the Thomas More years, today's graduate stands out for me. He's the only TMI student who was given my home phone number and the only one ever invited into my home and the only one I socialized with outside of the halls of TMI, a couple of plays, supper, many conversations. And there have been many students that have passed by me, through me at Thomas More Institute. Why have you given so much energy to this guy? I was asked several times. <laughs> Why? One reason is that there is a parallel between my early years at TMI and Alexis. A second reason and noteworthy is I believe in the results of intergenerational dialogue. Alexi and I provide a good example of this dialogue and the creative tension of differing viewpoints resulting in favorable synthesis. The past Sunday was Alexi's birthday. When I emailed him greetings, he mailed back stating, it's actually the big 30, Len. It is quite overwhelming as I had always intended on living in a perpetual state of adolescence." <laughs> Unquote. I'll mention two things to you, Alexi. Thing one is a lot of us hoped we'd remain in a perpetual state of adolescence, and there are those who get stuck in adolescence, sometimes until middle age. Thing two, the big O does not apply only to 30. Remember this. Just about every O after that, 40, 50, 60, and even beyond, is a big one. And your turning 30 this week reminded me of another convocation. This was 2008. Incisive Danny Shuela interviewed me as I was guest speaker at that convocation. He bringing to consciousness parts of my book that hadn't really occurred to me before. It was an evening I won't forget not even matched by the launch of my next book at TMI seven years later. Anyway, Alexi, your turning 30 this week motivated me to dig back into that 2008 convocation. And I found this that I quote from Raindrops, Glimpses, Moments, an Unconventional Memoir of an Unplanned Journey, which was my book. Here's what I put. When I was around 30, Assigned to create a new outdoor survival camp in the Laurentians, 
And John Heron, then in his 70s, was the exceptionally perceptive editor of the Royal Bank Monthly Letter. I enjoyed a brief personal correspondence with him, having read and been influenced by his monthly letter since my teens. Calling through old clippings from those letters of long ago, I came across something he wrote. Someone has said that the greatest mistake by the contemporary generation, any contemporary generation, is that it does not read the minutes of the last meeting. It starts its course with the handicap of having to learn all over again in practice what it could have learned readily from the records of its ancestors. 13 years later, John Heron wrote something else that I have retained, and I apply to the Alexi Len Mentorship Menti Adventure of the past eight years when so much has been happening in our society. Back then, we were approaching the eventual decline of the turbulent youth rebellions, parent offspring co conflicts, racism issues, social and political upheaval, and the bloody violence of the 1960s, the West's cultural revolution, as some people labeled it. Or as playwright Arthur Miller said, the only beneficiaries of that period were the record companies and gene manufacturers. John Heron stressed that while there are perfectly understandable differences between the generations, there was a great need for existing chasms to be bridged between them. Both sides have habits and thoughts that need adjustment, and they can reach that adjustment through dialogue. This need of adjustment has been with me, especially in recent decades, as I have aged. Observing and supporting Alexei, developing gray hairs because of him, the parallels keep coming to mind. I first arrived at TMI in 1966 in my 20s, just like Alexei, and I felt very intimidated. As I prepared for this June 11 convocation of Alexei, I was able to trace Alexei's growth for over eight years and review my eight years, also starting in my 20s, and also taking eight years or so to earn the degree at Thomas More. Eric O'Connor, a founder of TMI, was a first mentor. You have no limits, Len. And after the second mentor, the late Ben Shear, if you can read, you can do it. They both encouraged, sustained, one gently but firmly, the other with what I might term tough love and abiding belief in my abilities. Irene Muneer, colleague and friend here at TMI, said to me several times, we grew up at TMI, and we certainly did, in many ways, on many levels. If the formative years are associated with youth, the TMI experience then and now were, are formative because of TMI where confidence is developed and intellect widened. Man's mind stretched to a new idea, no, never goes back to its original dimension, ascribed to the famed and brilliant Oliver Wendell Holmes. It's certainly applicable to the TMI experience. I have enjoyed observing the stretching of the mind as I see it in Alexei's evolution in thinking. It's exciting and a privilege in the mentor-mentee rapport with him. I really believe that while there are perfectly understandable differences between the generations, the great need for existing chasms has been and continues to be bridged between Alex, myself, and older members of TMI. Both sides have thoughts that need adjustment and they can reach that adjustment through dialogue. This adjustment this dialogue has been evident throughout our eight year voyage, a trek that he and I shared of ups and downs, side roads, cul-de-sacs, and a map that he and I had to draw over and over and over again. If my two early mentors at told, uh, TMI told me that I have no limits and practice an abiding belief in my abilities, I say to you, Alexei, the third and really primary reason I stuck by you is you have no limits and my belief in you is also abiding. Please remember that in our culture's rush to advance, 
we sometimes forget that we see more and farther than our predecessors, not because we have keener vision or greater height, because we are lifted up and borne aloft on their gigantic statue. Or made famous by Isaac Newton, if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. That's been our journey. What's next, Alexei? Don't even try to answer. We'll see. We'll see. Now it's your turn. Good evening, everyone, staff, faculty, and guests. Uh, I've noticed I've been uh, allotted 15 minutes. I thought I had three. So uh, first thing I'm going to do is invoke Shakespeare, Polonius, and Hamlet when he says that brevity, brevity is the soul of wit. I'm going to expand on Shakespeare and say brevity is also the soul of this speech. I am fortunate to find myself here today as both the best and the worst graduate of the year. I will no doubt edit these details one day and proudly tell everyone that I was the top student of my class. I will be sure to leave out all other details. I arrived at Thomas More Institute almost nine years ago and I'm thrilled to finally be leaving. It was an interesting, challenging and dynamic journey, but I suppose nine years of long enough is long enough to get your bachelor's degree. My journey at TMI has taken me from being a young, silly whippersnapper to being a slightly older, grumpier whippersnapper. And it has been a very stimulating transition. After loafing around the entire summer of 2012, lazily trying to decide which university to attend and forgetting that my attendance was entirely contingent on my admittance, my mother began threatening me with carpentry school. If one thing intimidated me more than school, it was employment. I quickly got something of an act together, visited whichever university I could, including TMI, which was also a discovery of my mother. I was fortunate enough to bump into Len Richmond, who was immediately enthusiastic about my attending TMI and who, as of that point, made it his top priority to keep me from failing, despite my best efforts. If I were to compare my time at TMI to a myth or archetypal story, it would no doubt be the tale of Sisyphus, the Greek man who despised death and therefore put it in chains. He was punished by the gods, however, and because uh, they were displeased with him, and he was condemned to an eternal punishment whereby he was forced to roll a large boulder up a mountain only to have it roll back down. And he was forced to do it over and over again. In my version of the story, I am neither the protagonist nor the gods nor death, but am in fact the boulder. I am being rolled uphill constantly by my parents, by Len, by the entire, by the entire TMI community, and to a certain point, by society at large. I have most certainly been left with the impression that despite the fact that only a few names are remembered by history, all success is a collective effort. TMI allowed me to develop a number of interests. My first writing course here, basic essay writing, has given me, given me a lasting appreciation for grammar, vocabulary, and syntax. Other courses developed me, in me a notable devotion to discussion and debate. Throughout my first few years at TMI, I was typically very quiet during class, rarely contributing anything. Len would often repeat the line, still waters run deep in my defense, but I can admit now that there wasn't much depth to what I was thinking about. I, however, eventually gained a bit of self-assurance and confidence and have for the last few years been extremely vocal in class, perhaps sometimes to the annoyance of others. I have been known to lead discussions down very, very controversial tangents. TMI has also allowed me to generate a deep respect for liberal arts, for the classics, for history, literature, philosophy, and political science. Even my political orientation changed while I was at TMI. I entered as a disinterested, unlabeled, sort of centrist, and left slightly more conservative than Edmund Burke. The interest in liberal arts was even developed, developed to the point where I now read the classics recreationally. I was so unbelievably fortunate to have stumbled into TMI. In some ways, it was a final sanctuary in which I could get a degree on my own terms. Although I am the only graduate, I am most certainly as grateful as an entire class would be. I hope that many others who find themselves in situations similar to mine are able to come to TMI and be given such incredible support 
by such incredible people. In Human All Too Human, published in 1878, my favorite philosopher, Friedrich Nietzsche, wrote, success often gives an action the whole honest glamour of a good conscience. Failure casts the shadow of remorse over the estimable deed. Hence arises the well-known practice of the politician who thinks only grant me success. With that, I bring all the honest souls over to my side and make myself honest in my own eyes. So thank you very much for allowing me to see myself in a better light. And uh, it's been delightful. Thanks, Alexi. Honestly, eight, nine years ago, he never talked. He never <laughs> talked. This concludes our unique convocation for 2021, which we have recorded for our archives. Thank you all for taking the time to celebrate with us. Stay safe, stay well, and we'll see you either or both online and at TMI offices. Ken, could we yes. have a short recessional exit, please? All right. I'll play a slower tune called The Mist Covered Mountains. I forgot to give you the Gallic title. Tina Namorga. Morgana, those are the mountains. And he did, that means I see, I see the great mountains. Ah. Thank you again, Ken. Um, Pleasure. This, this is wonderful. Our captain of our TMI ship, Dina, runs a very tight ship. It's not even seven o'clock, and we were scheduled from 5 30 to 7. So Wonderful. Good night, everyone. Enjoy a wonderful summer ahead. Zoe, you can cut us out. Thank you.